Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to this conversation and workshop with Ann McSweeney on Child Care the Cooperative Way. Thank you very much for joining us. CAPITA is a nonprofit, independent, nonpartisan organization dedicated to ensuring a future in which all children and families flourish. And for the last several months, we have been exploring the role of worker cooperatives in building a more equitable childcare system. The democratic ownership and governance structure of cooperatives is designed to advance the social, cultural, and economic interests of their members. And as such, has, they have significant potential to better support the development and aspirations of historically underpaid childcare professionals while delivering better outcomes to the young children in their care. Moreover, cooperatives have a unique capacity to build solidarity. And the pandemic has demonstrated our independence, interdependence, and shared vulnerability and has especially illustrated the vulnerability of the childcare sector and all those who give care. In order to emerge from this crisis differently than before and better, not worse, we need to walk paths of solidarity and cooperation. Solidarity and cooperation of, together, of course, with more money to support care. These are the ingredients for coming out of the crisis better than before. Solidarity and cooperation give us antibodies that ensure the dignity and voice of each person and heal the structures in our society that have degenerated into systems of injustice and oppression. Cooperation promotes deep, meaningful diversity and equity by securing participation by all in the most important decisions to be made in, in a business and in society. We will not build back better after the pandemic just by listening to the voices from the field, a well-worn phrase in early childhood advocacy, but by building worker ownership, cooperation, and power, and promoting the exercise of that power and the rights of ownership in the everyday decisions that affect workers, children, and families in childcare settings across the country. Worker cooperatives are not the silver bullet for solving all the problems of childcare in America today. But any post pandemic rebuilding of childcare must promote more solidarity and cooperation through democratic governance and shared decision making in order to be better and not just return to the unjust and inequitable normal of the past. And so I'm grateful for Ann McSweeney taking the time today to walk us through how, at a practical level, we may promote the development of worker cooperatives in our communities and across the country for a more sustainable, more equitable child care sector. So with that, I'll turn things over to Ann McSweeney. Ann? Thank you so much, Joe, for having me and for those beautiful words. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so excited to have this sort of Day, the time to take this more practical approach, um, asking really, you know, what is a cooperative and why do we think that they are part of, of a solution to building a more equitable child care system? Um, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself and IPA. There we go. Um, so my name is Ann McSweeney. I'm the program director uh, for. Uh, our child care initiative at the ICA group. ICA is a 40 year old nonprofit business development firm focused on worker cooperatives and other initiatives that build worker voice, wealth, and power. And we have sister programs in the home care industry and alternative staffing, as well as geographic based initiatives to develop cooperatives. What we're going to be talking about today is our work with child care centers. Um, creating worker-owned child care centers from traditional businesses um, or conventionally owned businesses. But we also use cooperatives in several other ways to solve problems in the child care industry. 
creating um, purchasing cooperatives with home-based uh, family child care providers, as well as supporting some nanny co-ops. So we see cooperatives as a tool that can be used to solve a number of um, issues in child care, and as Joe said, just part of a, a larger toolkit um, that is required to really build back better. Um, so let's briefly go over our agenda, and please, um, I do have the chat up if you are able, um, just while I'm, I'm talking a little bit about what we're going to uh, go over today, if you could introduce yourself, um, share where you're coming from, um, and sort of the big question you're coming into this session with today, that'd be really helpful. Um, we can keep it in mind as we go through the session um, and answer them as I can. Um, and then we have a ton of time, I think, at the end to really dig in and I hope have a generative discussion um, going through all of your questions. So um, please use the chat to introduce yourself. So the goals for today um, are to do a lot of learning. I think we're going to cover a lot um, and, and hopefully find something meaningful, um, depending on whether you're coming into the session uh, knowing very, very little about cooperatives um, or someone really committed to developing a cooperative community um, in whatever context makes sense for you. Um, we're going to try and provide you something that will open your mind um, to this possibility. Uh, we're going to start with just an overview um, kind of what I would say is a maybe 201 level um, overview of what a co-op is. I'm not going to get, be getting too in the weeds, um, but my goal is to kind of give you enough of the how um, so that you understand the, the why of, of us doing this. Um, so we'll go quickly. There will be some new terminology. Um, please just you know, put any question you have in the chat as we go through that section. Then I'm going to be going over uh, ICA's theory of change, how we think that these um, co-ops can be part of a better system for childcare um, at a number of sort of intervention levels. And then finally, um, some ideas for ways that people in, in all sorts of positions can cultivate more cooperatives in, in your community. And after that, um, we'll have, I think, a, a large period of time for discussion, hope to generate more ideas than what I present on our slides today. Oh, great, I'm starting to see some introductions. I wish I could see your faces, um, but it's, it's great to just see the names at this point. Thank you so much. All right, so. We'll start our first section. What is a worker cooperative? And here's the definition. Um, there's three things I want to emphasize in this definition. First, a worker cooperative is a business. Um, it, is, it can be a small business. It can be a large business. It can be an LLC. It can be an S Corp. They take all different forms, but they are businesses designed to offer a product or service um, and earn a profit. I think there's an incredible amount of, of innovation and potential in the intersection between business and public programs, nonprofits, and we can talk about that in the, um, in the discussion. But I think it's important today to really forefront that we are talking about a business solution. The second part of the definition I want to talk about is a business owned and democratically controlled by its employees. And recognizing that those are two slightly different things. Um, it's possible to do profit sharing, employee stock ownership plans, other me methods of bringing workers, some workers, all workers, into ownership um, and the profitability of the business. But what we're talking about today is also uh, businesses that are controlled by their workers. Uh, in workplace democracy, and I, you know, democracy is an idea I think everyone on this call is going to be familiar with, but is quite new to most people in a workplace, and we'll dig into that more as well. And the final piece of this definition um, is owned by employees rather than a single owner, several partners or outside shareholders. I just want to call attention to this idea of shareholders, because I think it's a really critical kind of big picture concept to have in your mind as we go through this entire presentation, that the, the standard conventional way of doing business involves people contributing money, capital, to the business. And then on the basis of how much money they've contributed, that determines their share of the profits and their role in decision making. 
And worker cooperatives have take that concept and turn it on its head and say that it is in fact the, the work, the expertise, the labor that people put into the business that is what entitles them to a share of the profits and to a decision-making role in the business. And I think that particularly, um, and harkening back to, to Joe's introduction, in a, a caregiving industry in which we, we talk so much about um, how valuable the work of, of the child care work, of child care workers is, um, and yet so undervalued monetarily um, in terms of professional respect and decision making. Um, and as a as a society, I think are just first starting to reckon with the that devaluation stemming from a history of, of slavery, of oppression, um, gender and, and racist oppression that the, the centering of the value of work in this industry, in worker cooperatives, as an overarching concept, I think is incredibly powerful. And we're gonna dig into how and what that looks like, but I hope that that, that concept resonates with you and, and is something you can hold in your mind throughout the session today. So let's see, this definition will get a whole lot more specific on this next slide. So what does it actually mean for workers to own a business and control a business? Um, you get so many questions about that when this idea is first introduced to people. And there's three central tenets to this concept. The uh, first is that workers purchase a membership share to become an owner of the business. And in doing so, they have access to a vote in decision making on the business, and they are entitled to a portion of the business business's profit. So we're going to go through each one of these in just a little bit of detail um, so that you can understand the mechanics of a worker cooperative and how it generates the value that um, we've, I think, both expressed excitement around. So first, purchasing a membership share. So I think this is something that people have an incredible number of questions about because we're asking low-income workers to invest in their workplace. Um, which might seem kind of a contradictory concept or, you know, it should work the other way around. Um, but what we're asking when we ask workers to purchase a membership share is quite different from um, when someone is buying stocks or buying into a membership of a, of a business. In fact, the, the price of the membership share is not set in any way to the, the value of the business itself. It's something that's determined in the cooperative development process, whether it's a startup cooperative or the conversion of an existing business uh, to a cooperative. And it's set to be meaningful, but not prohibitive to that workforce. So in childcare, we've found that that buy-in, it makes sense to have it be about 200 to thousand dollars. And the reason that we ask people to buy in um, is to um, establish it, a sense of, of ownership. It, it's often you know, described as a skin in the game. But you have invested in this business, and therefore you have a responsibility and a benefit if this business does well. And the business has a responsibility and accountability to you as an investor. It's one of the things that sets the whole idea of, of a worker cooperative apart from just sort of a, a nice place to work or a place that listens to your opinion. It's something um, much more structural than that. Um, the reason why the membership share is set in a way that is not in direct proportion to the business is because the, the core value here is one of access. We want workers who are able to buy into a small childcare business um, a work front business with, you know, maybe there's eight of them and it might be possible for them to start it as a partnership and all contribute enough um, equity to, to get a small business going. But then as it grows, you can see how, a, you know, a three site or a larger business would quickly become possible for workers to buy into um, if the membership share was, was set to the business value. The other benefit is that you know, workers can come into ownership um, and leave ownership without um, much hassle, um, without evaluation of the business. So in a healthy membership, um, a healthy work, worker ownership, members are, are meeting eligibility requirements, they're paying in, they're becoming members, and leaving, member, um, leaving membership on a regular basis. 
and one misconception a lot of people have is that you know there might be only you know 10 membership slots and people have to kind of wait their turn to become members this uh, way of sort of accounting for ownership enables the membership to grow and, and shrink as appropriate to that workforce um, and uh, that's just a really important important part of the, the sustainability here so the, the I think the key values that I want to emphasize are that um, access is the priority um, even if a thousand dollars in uh, a buy-in fee is prohibitive to a child care worker um, oftentimes when we're working through these deals um, we're even financing that piece so that the worker can contribute that money over, you know, payroll deductions over a year or two. Um, and what I hope this calls attention to is the way in which people are constantly being brought into ownership um, addresses a real succession issue in childcare. So oftentimes we have incredible childcare business owners who own a center for 30 years. Um, and then what happens when they retire? You know, what what is the business then is you know critical thing to figure out without them um but in a worker co-op you're constantly bringing workers into membership they can advance in their learning and skills and even join the board um, and you kind of have that consistency to anchor the business in its community um, and still have some succession issues with you know you, have, you can lose a great director and really feel the crunch but the the business is much more stable over time, which I think is an incredible value when you think about the types of businesses we want to invest resources um, and funding into. And let me move on a little bit. Looking forward to answering more questions about membership share later on. So the other big area where we get a lot of questions is in the decision making um, component of ownership. Um, what does it mean for workers? to make decisions in their workplace. Um, you know, people wonder, can you have a, a worker co-op, can you have a child care center that doesn't have a leader, that doesn't have a director, that doesn't seem right to me. Um, and as you'll see, that's, that's not the case here. That's not the, um, the way that this actually works out. Um, another question that I think is a very valid question is, you know, do workers really wanna take the time? Do they wanna be involved in these decisions? And one thing that has to be balanced really carefully is valuing the time of workers so that they can have meaningful input without sort of dragging the company down and having everyone have to be consulted for every decision. We have a system to do that that I'm gonna show you really quickly. Um, I wanted to quickly go over this decision-making structure. Um, I think it provides a lot of clarity. Once workers buy that membership share they become part of the co-op membership they then elect uh, board members or can run for the board that leads the business and the board can um, include other stakeholders it could have a parent could have an accountant a lawyer a community leader um, others who bring value into the business but workers make up the majority of the board in order to really center worker voice in the business. And that board of directors then supervises the management. Uh, so they perform annual evaluations. They work with the management to set annual budgets. Um, and, they, and then the management in turn supervises the workers. So within one childcare business, a, a worker could wear three hats at a given time. They could be a worker um getting direction from a boss on, on how something needs to be done they could be a co-op member voting on, on big issues in the cooperative voting for board members and if they're a board member um they also are playing a, a board role um and i think as you can imagine this this takes training this takes practice um it's something that i think is incredibly valuable um and I think aligned with a lot of the um, cooperative or the um, collaborative leadership, entrepreneurial leadership, mentor, mentor coaching, a lot of these trends in childcare to really think critically about the, the human side of, of the childcare workforce and how kind of the best outcomes for children require workers who have this, the structures and support um, 
for their own well-being to be able to, to teach children and care for children effectively. Um, but I don't want to downplay that there's a lot of, of learning and organizational development that goes into setting up a system like this. Then I want to just give you a quick example of what this looks like. So this is a, a part of a decision-making chart that we actually used um, and developed with one of our clients, a, a small childcare business. Um, and because it's small, uh, all of the members are also board members, um, which helps this chart fit on the slide. Um, but it's not the case in every in every business. Um, and one thing that I should emphasize is that this is a very flexible model. So this is just what they felt was right for them, um, but it's not sort of the way that this would work in every childcare co-op. Um, but what I want you to pay attention to here, if you kind of go to the top of the key, is the decides. Um, and this is a really critical thing for um, childcare co-ops to, to work through. It's the system in which the membership, the workers on the board, um, are setting some annual goals, they're setting an annual budget, they're setting, in this example, a pay scale. They have a lot of important um, decisions to make about this business. But in the day-to-day -day implementation of, the, of that vision, the director has the, the control. They're the ones making the big purchases. They're the ones that are actually in the business's financial accounts. Um, making payments, checking on payroll. I think that's sort of the overarching way that this, that this works, is that the director retains, and I think it's very important that the director retains day-to-day -day oversight over the business, but in a meaningful way, workers are participating in the direction and priorities of the business through the board structure. So we can dig into this more as well. Um, but we're going to move on for the sake of time. Final area, um, a really key component and another area where we get many, many questions um, is on profit sharing. And people wonder kind of how that works. <laughs> um, and you know, what does that look like in, in real terms? Um, so I want to provide this flow um, of the ways that, that co-ops, this is a very high level, um, the ways that co-ops handle profit sharing. So they track um, you know, revenue and expenses throughout the year. Almost always annually, they come up with their, um, their profit to be allocated. That profit is retained, some of it is retained in a collective account. And then some of it is distributed to employees um, through cash or held in an internal account, which is also where the um, the workers buy-in goes into, and that is money that is owed to the worker when they leave the business. And there's a couple things I want to highlight here. One, um, but this is a, a systematic way in which co-ops think about, um, you know, a rainy day fund and a growth fund, um, and that it, it requires a high degree of transparency and accountability. Workers have to have access to basic business metrics um, to understand what their profit allocation is going to be. And they have to be able to look, in most co-ops, they can, um, there's something called open book management, where workers have access to financial information um, for pretty much everything other than individual salaries. So there's different ways that that can be set up. So this is, when we talk about co-ops, as being accountable to workers, as being a transparent place. Um, this visibility of both the financial information and the decision-making information through um, the, the decision-making, the governance system that I just showed, and through this um, system of accounting, it's a big, this is, this is the meat of it. Um, so I want to sit for a second with this information. Um, and see if you have any questions. I can go back to any slides. Um, but also, I'm curious, just in that first pass, um, in what ways do co-ops seem different? In what ways do co-ops seem more the same than kind of conventional childcare businesses to you? And do you see any strengths or challenges just from that initial introduction? I'll give a second. I'll also check. I think I might have some questions in the Q&A section.
So just drop any thoughts in the chat or you can just kind of sit with those questions um, if you don't feel ready to share. All right, I don't see anything in the chat, so let me um, take on some of the uh, questions we've gotten. So there's one question about, are, is there conflict between management and workers regarding um, the decisions that people disagree with? Yes, <laughs> I, mean, I think there's conflict, um, you know, between management and workers in all organizations. Um, I think that co-ops, provide a lot of um, of systems to, to deal with those conflicts um, through through the members of the of the board through committees um, I oftentimes there you know co-op developers are providing conflict resolution meeting facilitation trainings to build up those skills so it's absolutely a, a process um, for working through those, those conflicts um, we have two questions about um, wealth building and, um, you know, how this model has been shown to, to build worker wealth. Um, I want to get through the next section before I answer, answer those. Um, sorry to not be able to do this face to face, um, Ellen. Um, giving examples, examples that cause problems with the business, um, related to conflicts between management and workers. I think, uh, yeah, there are a lot of examples where, um, management workers have had conflicts, um, that our clients have been working through. I think, you know, one interesting example um, was related to increasing tuition, where workers who were kind of interfacing with parents every day actually didn't want to raise tuition and were very upset at the idea of raising tuition. Um, and management was looking at the, the numbers and really saying that this was, was critical. I think that that, in a way, is a, a great example of the way in which more information kind of enables people to have those conversations in a meaningful way. Um, but it wasn't an easy, it was, the outcome in that case was that they raised tuition a little bit, but not as much as management originally was at, uh, asking to. Um, so, you know, compromise. Um, I'm trying to think of workers are much more involved in decision making than conventional businesses. Um, yeah, so I want to move on to the next section um, about those questions related to building worker wealth. And you know, let me go back to these slides just so you can see. Um, you know, I think one question we get a lot is just, you know, how how much do workers make? You know, what is the profit share? Um, and it feels disingenuous to give any sort of average there um, because it varies so widely across our clients um, and is in this state of flux during COVID. Um, let's not beat around the bush with that. Um, and it also, I think, I just want to, to add another layer there that I think we've found that there really isn't a connection between how excited and engaged workers are about this process and taking on this role in their company. We're typically working with businesses that already existed, were conventionally owned, and are, are switching over to a worker ownership model. Um, that is not, you know, connected to the amount of profit that workers would see, um, how excited they are about this idea. And I think for a number of our uh, clients, it's about continuation of a workplace that they love um, and some added wealth um, and continued jobs in, in some cases in places where um, those jobs are, are scarce. Um, so that's 
a complicated answer. Um, but let's talk more about it in the next section. So how do we stay co-op um, building a more equitable and sustainable industry? So ICA has a theory of change specifically for low wage industries, um, our home care and our child care program where we like to think about the impact that co-ops are able to provide on three different levels, sort of the individual business level or the firm, a network of businesses, and then at a societal level. So kind of what I was just sharing about our clients is where we see um, impact at a firm level. So within the context of a single business, I think Transitioning that business to worker ownership is incredibly meaningful for those workers. Having that additional control, having a sustainable um, path forward when a, when a business owner is retiring, um, having the ability to use what profit they, um, that business does generate in the way that is most meaningful to workers, um, which sometimes is not allocation directly to workers, but business decisions that cost money, um, like paid planning time or health insurance or other things that are work priorities for the workers. Um, so within that framework, we, we think we can make better jobs for childcare workers, but we can't make great jobs, uh, living wage jobs. We can't get to parity with K through 12 um, salaries through just transitioning to worker ownership. There just simply isn't enough profit in the, um, in the system as it currently stands, as many of your questions have, um, have shown. Where we think that co-ops can add some additional value is in their, the structural ways um, in which we think they're advantaged to network together. Um, and here we're really building off of the work that our sister program in home care has done where they've had a national network of worker-owned home care agencies for, I, I believe, a decade now. Um, and that network of agencies has worked together um, to foster the development of additional, of additional agencies. Um, their numbers are growing rapidly, um, doing shared strategic work around marketing, um, advancing best practices throughout their field, and um, now are coming together forming a co-op model, a democratic model, to work together to do shared purchasing. Um, they just purchased uh, PPE and other supplies as a collective, um, or as a co-op, <laughs> I should say. Um, so all of this sort of benefits around um, intentional cultural building, governance, um, transparency around finances, we think really fit into an ability to build off of the ideas of shared services um, and other models within the field and create more profitable businesses, uh, worker-owned businesses, by networking them together um, as chains um, or through secondary cooperatives. But then we also recognize the ways in which um, there are some really structural issues that childcare is, is facing and we are seeking to get it at the scale, you know, either at a lo local level, uh, state or national level, to push on other employers to improve their, their policies and practices, um, to compete with the job offers of worker-owned firms um, and push the standards of the industry up. I also think that worker owners, in representing the interests of, of both owners of child care businesses and workers of child care um, in the child care industry um, are incredible advocates and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, about kind of the critical market failures in the industry because they wear both hats. We want to dig in a little bit more to some of these concepts in the next slide. So again where do we where do we see the benefits of the cooperative model? So within individual workplaces, building voice, wealth, and power to the extent that that individual business is able to with its current market situation. And again, this, this can feel meaningful when workers are going to get thousands of dollars in profit sharing. And you know, in some cases, when they'll get a couple hundred dollars in profit sharing. Um, for centers, 
um, looking at the very small field we have of, of child care, of um, cooperatively owned child care centers in the U.S., um, and then also looking at other fields. Um, we have some evidence for enhanced staff um, retention and also business sustainability, especially you know, surviving downturns, something that feels um, incredibly relevant in this current, current moment um, that worker cooperatives often you know, make it through uh, economic recession um, and have shown that they have, are less likely to have um, staff reduction during those times. Then I think the cooperative model um, provides a pathway, um, again, looking to the home care industry, which we're, we're trying to replicate that strategy, to achieve scale while still maintaining local character. So in the, um, the co-op, you have huge home care co-ops. Um, based on the Bronx, you have tiny home care co-ops in rural Wisconsin, incredibly different businesses. They are using the cooperative structure um, and cooperative values to work together. Um, and this isn't anything against um, you know, the big chains um, or regional chains, um, but I think we, we lose something if those are the only scale businesses that are able to survive the, cur the current conditions in childcare. Um, and this is a way for small businesses that reflect their community uh, to come together and, and survive um, what we, I think, all anticipate to be a tough year. And then finally, um, just thinking about, you know, I still have some hope that we're going to witness a real reinvestment or maybe a first time investment, deep investment in the child care industry. And how we direct that investment, where, um, where it goes and who benefits, I think is incredibly challenging because parents and families, child care workers and child care owners have, have gone without for so long. We need sophisticated tools to make sure that, you know, when a state government or a city government or a philanthropic organization is investing in their local childcare uh, ecosystem, they understand kind of what that money is going to be used for and where it's going to go. And I think worker cooperatives are um, an excellent vehicle for that and it's something to really explore more, um, looking to other countries' models as well. Um, so let me just say one more thing about this before we get into the kind of concrete ways you can develop more or co-ops in your community. But I think that it would be incredibly inappropriate for me to talk about this work um, without acknowledging Child Space, which is a worker-owned child care company that has existed since 1989 in Philadelphia. Um, ICA has worked closely with them for decades. Um, and I think they really show um, on so many of the levels I just laid out, the ways in which um, child care co-ops can improve outcomes for, for children. They have um, a mission that quality jobs leads to quality care, and I think they've shown that in their NACI accreditation, in their Head Start programs, and in their commitment to their, the children of their community. Um, they have um, really you know, top of the line benefits, um, paid time off, paid training, um, and have retained workers at kind of twice the rate, um, or I guess rather their turnover rate is half the industry average. Um, and they're incredible advocates for their field and are able to show up to um, advisory uh, groups in the city of Philadelphia and in the state of Pennsylvania and really speak to the needs of both owners and workers, which is incredibly rare. Um, I think have had a real impact on the local ecosystem that way. Um, and in surviving COVID, they to avoid staff layoffs, um, which is almost unheard of, I think, right now. Um, and then they reopened. Um, they offered virtual services to their family throughout closure and, and reopened when they could. And I just, when we think about what it means for uh, worker owners to really be stewards um, of this industry and, and a centered voice in what this industry should look like, um, I just want to say, I think child space is, is that example, um, something that I drive. Um, a lot of um, momentum from um, and energy in this work. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any additional questions. Oh, yes. So 
I just want to, I think I mentioned this briefly at the, um, at the beginning of the session, but we do also um, support work with purchasing co-ops of family child care providers. Um, so those aren't technically worker owned co-ops um, and aren't covered in these slides, but they, um, because they are connecting businesses, which are essentially one person or maybe one person and assistant, they feel a lot like worker co-ops. Um, so we have a couple different projects like that across the country. Um, the one in Philadelphia is focusing on training um, and provide, providers training other providers, providers getting access to training in a cost-effective way. Um, although they're also exploring, especially during COVID, other kind of shared purchasing um, services. And then we have um, projects in Chicago as well um, that are bringing providers together to access um, public funding sources that they wouldn't otherwise have access to um, as single home-based providers. So it's, you know, I think a lot of the principles are the same um, related to the ways that co-ops can bring people together in kind of a more transparent and equitable way, um, but it's a little bit of a different model. Um, that hopefully answers your question. Okay. So the final um, area that we're gonna to discuss today is for those of you who are raring to go and want to start some co-ops or encourage um, the creation of co-ops in your community, what can you do? Um, and I want to acknowledge that, you know, in this current moment, given the situation that the child care industry faces, um, can feel like, um, you know, we're, we're pulled in a lot of directions for the ways that we can support the industry. And so these ideas, I, I tried to focus on um, ways that cooperatives can be integrated into things we might already be doing, um, ways that cooperatives could play a role in um, work and funding sources you already have. Um, but of course, there's also kind of big programmatic ways. You can encourage um, co-op development in, in your ecosystem. Um, that we can discuss as well during the final section of, of this presentation. So one of the big barriers that um, co-op development faces is just that a lot of people in the childcare industry don't know what a co-op is um, and whether it's someone who might want to start, um, start a business or is thinking about exiting their business they just don't know that cooperatives are an option. Um, so one thing that I think all uh, organizations that work in childcare that have relationships um, or provide services to childcare business owners can do is just mention it in, in your regular TA um, training, coaching, um, much easier um, if people kind of know about co-ops as an option before they're sort of at like that inflection point. Um, someone who wants to retire tomorrow um, is going to have a hard time transitioning their business to a co-op. Um, but if we integrate some information about co-ops and in integrate information just generally about exit planning and the importance of planning for um, the next phase for your business, um, then childcare businesses I think across the country will be able to sort of come to this idea on their own time. Um, which I think would be incredibly powerful. Um, of this, all of the support services that I know uh, so many organizations are playing in helping childcare businesses adapt through COVID um, and understand their budget um, on a much more critical and sort of fine-tuned level um, in order to survive. Um, all of that kind of builds up the capacity and the systems that would enable a transition to worker ownership down the road. Um, so you, you're probably already helping build a co-op ecosystem through some of these services. Okay. So the next area is a really big one. Um, and I just will think back a second to one of the early slides about what are we really asking for when we're asking for, for workers to um, invest in their business. And you know, we saw that number that's you know, two, um, 200 to $1,000 typically. Um, but of course, childcare businesses to either start or buy are, are much more expensive than that. 
Um, so there's a real need for access to capital to kind of fill the gap. And ICA works with selling owners to sell or finance a portion of the sale of their business. Um, we have a loan fund that provides some um, gap financing as well. Um, but there's a real need for all, all types of different funding, um, ranging from financing buy-in fees. Uh, you know, if, if you're a micro lender, um, that's one way you could get involved in supporting co-ops is offering to finance buy-in fees for the new members. Um, that can be just a couple thousand dollars that enables them to pay it, uh, pay their buy-in over time through payroll deductions instead of needing to come up with a thousand dollars right away, which we know a lot of um, child care workers can't do. Um, there's also, you know, much bigger costs related to purchasing real estate. Um, that's another way that um, you can really anchor a worker-owned child care business into your community and, you know, build wealth that can be leveraged for growth or um, the business's survival over time um, as that property, um, you know, gains in value. Um, so whether you are um, someone who gives, you know, very small loans or very large loans, there's a place for you <laughs> in cooperative lending. Um, it's something, if you're interested in it at all, we can connect you to banks that um, specifically seek to foster cooperatives and have systems for uh, doing that that, that don't requ require um, large amounts of money or personal guarantees from low-income workers, which is something that is really important. Um, there's also, um, you know, all of the ways that we seek to kind of shore up the gaps in childcare business growth, um, whether it's, you know, startup incubators and startup funding, expansion grants, emergency grants, um, consider ways that you can look um, to include cooperatives in those grant programs um, and, and prioritize them as, as an asset to the community. Um, you can, if you aren't a, a lender or a funder, um, you can explore community partnerships to help bring down the cost. I and mean, this is primarily for startups, um, but there are some situations where you know, parents and community stakeholders in a community have found really low cost space or even free space um, that made it possible to start you know, the launch of a business that wouldn't have existed without that. Um, if you're connected to your community, um, it might make sense for you to spearhead a crowdfunding or a direct public offering as a way to finance cooperatives in your community. Um, and co-ops can be part of if you're a city planner uh, or you know can similarly situated an advocate. Um, co-ops can be part of development plans um, in a whole host of ways. So making sure that there is capital available to start co-ops is I think one of the most critical things you can do and I think ties directly into um, concerns that exist across the childcare ecosystem about how expensive it is to start up a childcare business, you know, declining rates of lending, um, particularly to women of color. I think there are, there's just a lot that needs to be done here beyond co-ops um, to make sure that um, childcare continues to be a place of, of entrepreneurialism for, for women and particularly women of color. So I look forward to additional ideas on that as well. And then finally, I kind of saved this sort of big idea for last, but what I, I hope is clear through this presentation um, is that cooperatives are, are, are structural system, but are also about mindset shift um, and centering workers and their, their capacity to lead. Um, and I think that anyone in the child care industry right now who's thinking about, um, you know, the idea that we need to do business in a different way, that the child care industry needs to look different and is centering the development of, of the voice of, of workers, um, the leadership of workers, in their thinking about that and bringing advocates from across the industry together, I think is you know building such a critical foundation to um, co-op development um, and combating that idea of oh you know people can't do this um, they don't have the skills they don't have the knowledge um, there's so much value in helping people um, understand 
um, their, the business that they work in um, and ways it could change. So I, I think that folks all across the industry are starting to see that. And I think it's something that goes hand in hand with co-op development um, in a really critical way. So those are just a few ways um, that I think some of the people on this call could help support the development of co-ops, but I'm really eager to um, hear other ideas. Um, Joe, is there any way we can do a discussion that we see um, faces, or will we just get the questions and, and answer them that way, which is fine? Um, I'll go ahead and, oh, you can't hear me anymore? I hope others can hear me. I, I'll go ahead and answer a question from, from Lily, um, which is, uh, do we have advice on how to find members and then to make the model seem doable? Um, our program is primarily um, focused on working with existing childcare businesses. Um, typically where the owner is thinking about exiting, um, retiring or, or moving on for other reasons. Um, so we're coming in and talking to a workplace, a group of staff that have experience working together about this model and whether it's something that they would be interested in and um, the way that we typically do that is to you know provide a general presentation to the entire workforce um, and at that point the only question is just are you interested in learning any more about this it's not hey do you want to buy this business um, in this way that you've never heard of before um, but coming out of that meeting we ask a couple people who are really interested and there usually are people that are more hesitant and people who are really excited um, but we we asked the, the folks that are really excited to form a steering committee and work through some of the structural questions of what this would look like um, there, there are a series of decisions that people have to make about exactly what their co-op looks like and what's going to work for them and then you know through that process through a lot of learning about the, fi the finances of the business as well as how the you know, the governance would work. Um, we hopefully get more, more and more people excited. Um, and one thing that I think is important to note is that not everyone has to become a, a worker owner. Um, you know, what we're looking for is typically over 50% of workers to become worker owners. That's part of what kind of creates a culture of ownership in the business that we think is really, really important. Um, but if there are people that have hesitations or aren't ready to do it right, you know, at the point of transition, that's completely fine. Um, and other people can can um, can lead the way and hopefully convince them over time that it's something that is, um, you know, empowering and, and worth their while. Um, there are startup projects um, that uh, other cooperative development organizations have undertook, um, bringing together people who are interested in childcare entrepreneurship um, to come together as a worker co-op. Um, I think it's much easier to find people who want to own their own childcare center than um, people who want to own a childcare center together. So I think there's some, you know, real cultural building that needs to be done around that um, and making sure that it's the right choice for those, those entrepreneurs to launch together. But that absolutely um, can be done. I think it's a great option. Um, you know, we talk to so many home-based family child care providers who are interested in starting a center one day but don't have the capital to do it on their own. Um, and I think that there could be, you know, a really interesting and important project that brings those providers together um, to create a cooperative child care center. And could you, could you talk a little bit about the, the role of CDFIs, banks, credit unions, and how to engage them locally uh, around financing a cooperative ecosystem in child care? Yeah, and let me 
show one additional slide that I threw in, um, anticipating there might be some questions along these lines. Um, but this is an, just an example of how one child care sale to, to its workers can come together. Um, so in, in this case, the business um, as a whole was worth $120,000. Workers each contributed $500 a piece. The owner took a note, um, and then the you know the bank financing was seventy five thousand dollars, a portion of the total cost. Um, we work primarily with CDFIs um, on that that piece of the transaction, and one of the reasons for that is that um, you know we're typically coming together um, or, or bringing together a, a deal that doesn't ask the workers to put um, any personal guarantee you know, related to their, their house or their car or other assets that, that they have. Um, and the banks are, are financing the co-op on kind of the strength of the, the membership, how many workers want to do this, how committed they are to building this business, um, and the analysis of a co-op developer like ICA and the community of co-op developers um, that exist across the country in saying, you know, the this is this is a successful business um and we you know we believe that this business can pay off its loans um that is a really critical piece of um enabling people who would not otherwise have access to ownership and child care um to be able to become worker owners um so we work really closely with banks to understand their concerns and kind of address them through the cooperative development process but it's not um you know, child care businesses don't have that much collateral. Their workers don't have a lot of personal assets. Um, so it is a very different lending process um, in which, you know, these uh, CDFIs and the, the banks that we work with are looking for other assurances that this business is strong. Great. We do have a few minutes. If there are any other questions that you have, uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining us and for, for participating in this conversation with Anne. And um, maybe one final thought from you could be, uh, how, how does one go about working with ICA Group? Absolutely. We, um, so we're a national organization. We're based out of Massachusetts, but we do work across the country. Um, and we work with um, a host of, of different partners, um, you know, community um, organizations, unions, um, philanthropy, um, and get pulled into projects related to co-op development at all different levels. Um, so we have projects in four states right now where we're doing direct outreach with child care business owners, um, particularly retiring child care business owners, to educate them about um, this model and that it's an option for them. Um, but then we also get pulled into, um, you know, specific um, projects and just work, you know, help uh, work through the valuation of the business um, and the, the stages of cooperative conversion, which I can pull up as well. Um, can I pull it up? Um, there we go. Um, so we do outreach and education to business owners, but then we also sometimes get pulled in at a point where, um, you know, maybe a community foundation or another group has identified um, typically a large child care business that they really don't want to see closed um, and ask, you know, can you work with, with us to find out whether it's feasible to save this business um, by having it transition to worker ownership. So that's another kind of, I think, exciting way for us to get pulled in on a, on a smaller scale. Um, let's see if you guys have additional questions. There was, of course, Anne, the question about the availability of these slides, and uh, we have recorded this webinar, so you can review it uh, again. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly share it with you all as well. Great. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, Anne, so much for uh, leading this conversation and really helping us understand a little bit more about the practicalities of moving childcare businesses to worker ownership. Uh, grateful for your time and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we will, of course, uh, share these resources with you all. And uh, ICA is helping facilitate these transitions, facilitate the development of uh, worker cooperatives across sectors, really. But it's, it's thrilling that they have a dedicated childcare program. And so please, please consider reaching out to them and to their team uh, to find out how you can build a cooperative ecosystem in your community. And certainly that's part of what Capita is very interested in doing uh, across the country. So uh, please be in touch with us as well if we can assist uh, you in any way. So with that, uh, thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Joe, and for everyone participating.